Hmm. Hello everybody, we're back with another video. I actually was going to record this video yesterday, but my mic's run out, uh, so I had to charge them overnight and here we are again this morning. Got another video for you today and it's going to be breaking down the little documentary video that I did with my friend Abby called Digbeth. Now I'll drop links to this film in the description below, so if you haven't had a chance to check it out, head down there and check it out and let me know what you think of it in the comments. But this video, I'm gonna chat through the ideas, the pre-production and the gear I used and also some problems I hit on the way. And hopefully this might help you if you are looking to do similar projects like this on your own. So let's dive in to the video. So I wanted to document my friend Abby and her art project Digbeth uh, that she's been super heavily invested in over the past year. Now Abby's process of creating and her style is really interesting and I wanted to find out what drives her to create and the emotional ties to the pieces that she creates and the energy that actually goes into making these pieces. So we filmed over two days and I really wanted to capture the process in the studio and talk about the pieces she had created and delve through her notebooks and stuff like that. And then I wanted to visit Digbeth on the second day and see the areas where Abby had really connected with and found some inspiration for her works. Firstly, I'm gonna say that there are some aspects to this film I think I could have done better, but when you were working alone and setting up lighting, audio, and doing the interview and the camera work, it can be hard to get everything as perfect as you wish, and you will find it a lot easier when you have a crew. So what I'm trying to say there is when you're working alone, give yourself a little bit of credit for the effort that you're putting in because it's not an easy task to pull off little documentaries like this. So just get out there, film it, and learn from the process. The documentary was shot on my Lumix S5 II, and the city scenes the second day I shot on the Lumix S5 IIX that I had just recently purchased. I absolutely love this camera, and the image that comes out of it is really nice to grade in post-production. It almost reminds me a little bit of the Blackmagic image. It really holds the highlights well and retains some great details in the shadows, so it's, it's really nice to work with. So as I was mainly filming handheld, I rigged out the camera to make the handheld a little easier and reduce the micro jitters as best possible. And I had planned to shoot the whole film using the Seven Artisan Spectrum lenses, but I only actually had 35mm available at the time. So the studio section I did film with the Lumix S range of lenses. I used 24mm and the 50mm 1.8 lenses, and I used a Nisi Black Mist 1.8 on the front just to break up that digital feel. Now, I actually do like the quarter mist in the Nisi range, but I felt it was a little too strong for this project, especially on the outdoor filming sections. With a quarter mist, I find it can get really messy quickly shooting into bright lights. You just get these huge like blooms of light and it can actually like interfere with the framing and the subjects. So I decided to avoid that on this shoot. When it came to lighting, I really wanted to do some kind of grand lighting scheme, but lighting wise, the room was really well lit when I got there. There's a huge bay window in the front of the studio. And this window also had like stained glass across each panel, which actually became a bit of an issue as it was casting different hues around the room and onto the table and being a solo shoot, I couldn't really set anything up to avoid this. So where possible, I tried to work as best as I can away from it. Didn't really help that the location was sun facing also. I used the Sunseeker app when I got there to see where the light was coming, but the sun was really, really low that morning and it started to blast through and it was in and out of the clouds. And when I was there capturing the interview, it was hard to keep a consistent look across the interview, especially with this stained glass kind of colors. And this is why when filming the interviews in locations like this, you want to control the lighting as much possible. But when you are working on your own, it's hard to like black out everything and light everything as you want. So this did cause me to cut the actual main talking head interview out of the film as the light was just too varying in the shots and I decided to chop it all out which I actually did prefer so this is a great reason to catch as much b-roll as possible when you are filming because sometimes you're going to need that to make better creative decisions back in post if you have issues like this now I used a small falconized panel to wrap the light and just boost the natural lighting in the room when I was doing the interviews and doing the shots. I also had a negative fill floppy flag to help take some of the light away on the other side of Abby when I was doing the interview and some of the shots in the frame. As the room was like, like I say, it was like really, really bright and the walls were cream color and it 
almost got this horrible greenish tint on the shot. So actually, I was really pleased with some of the shots that I got out of the studio in the end, considering the lighting issues that I was up against. Now, when it came to audio, I actually went with the Sennheiser AVX mic system straight into camera. I've got two sets of these that I always carry with me. I keep the Sennheiser AVX system in my kit because they work on a different frequency to the Rode system. So if I have a problem with the Rode system, I know I can flip over to the AVX system. And that's something that is really, really useful to be able to quickly change if you are getting issues. So that's just a little tip for you guys working in different locations with so much Wi-Fi in the world uh, and everything like that it can really interfere with some of these mics i laved up abby and allowed me to basically hit record and follow her around and chat and this gave me some really nice flowing dialogue and bits to utilize in the film and this is me sort of moving on to the next stage of life it's an archway so i'm sort of and it's windy i'm getting drawn through to the next sort of part of my life. I love doing this as it adds a whole new perspective to what would be a standard sit down interview feel. Having that dynamic chat with subjects while they're holding and looking at objects, looking at artwork, really adds that new connection to them because it almost allows them to forget that you're actually filming them. And this gives some great bits for your films. And I'm actually going to say it's a really good idea to maybe start off your film if you've got someone who is actually nervous. Instead of just sitting them down and throwing the camera straight in front of them, you could just lav them up, mic them up, and then just walk around and follow them, have a chat about stuff, and you'll get some really good stuff without them actually feeling the pressure to talk directly to camera. Because some people that is not an easy thing to do and it takes a little time to warm them up so sometimes you could just maybe mic them up walk around talk to them about objects and stuff like that just get to know each other build that rapport and then you can go and do that sit down interview and they're going to feel a lot more comfortable so i'm just going to talk a little bit about the pre-production and how i went about this I use Milano a lot. I know everyone uses Milano, but it is really, really good tool. You can actually board out, get all the ideas together. But this project was fairly straightforward for me. I kind of knew the direction that I wanted to go. And I ended up just finding some screenshots of processes of art and documentary photos of art so I could see the kind of angles that I'm thinking of getting. And once I kind of got that idea together, it was purely just making some really good questions that I knew was going to trigger Abby to talk about certain things and certain angles to her artwork. So I just ended up sitting down for a day, I built out some really good questions and I was really pleased with them in the end. And actually when we were doing the interview, we kind of went through a lot of the questions and I found that questions led to questions and then Abby started opening up and we chatted for about an hour and it was really good. I got some really great answers. Day one was the master interview and the studio B-roll. This was the day I wanted to sit down with Abby and really get the main bits for the film and build the story out. We chatted for about an hour or so and some really great stuff came out of it. Abby was actually really natural in front of the camera and I didn't really detect much nerves with her. I think it helps that I'm a relatively chatty person. So it really helps in interview situations as people tend to open up quickly once I start getting in the flow and just chatting to them. And often I find questions lead to certain trails of thought and this can really deepen the questions uh, and the answers that you're going to get out of people. Like I say before, this is where pre-production and having those questions prepped is really important. Creating that connection and getting people to open up will change your documentaries. If you are someone who struggles naturally building conversation, it's really great to have a chat with your subject before you do anything. Like I said earlier, you could actually lav them up and just maybe have a chat, sit down, have a coffee with them and not even actually run the camera, but you're catching the audio. You wanna really build that great rapport this way instead of just diving straight in with the camera, which is really intimidating for a lot of people. So although this seems obvious, it's often really overlooked by people and I see a lot of people making this mistake, just getting in there, throwing the camera. So maybe if you divert to a new technique, you're gonna get some better answers for your film. So day two was fairly simple. Um, it was a walk around and exploring areas of dig birth with Abby. Abby brought some work with her actually that she was working on at the time. So I ended up just catching her working on the new pieces of artwork. We walked around, we talked about the textures of the building, the looks of the building. And also it was really cool to see some of the artwork that Abby had created that the buildings have now gone or they're being knocked down or they're being changed. So 
It really added to that feeling of actually, you can see the timeline of the whole city, like from when Abby arrived and she'd done all this artwork through to the fact that it's now changing into a bigger city. They're starting to develop a lot of the areas. So it was really cool. And I think it was really nice for Abby as well because Abby's actually moved out to Bristol now and seeing her just have this last, almost last moment with Birmingham was really, really cool. And I think it meant a lot to her in the end that we actually ended up doing this little documentary. So I'm just gonna briefly talk about my editing techniques when it comes to doing documentaries like this. It can be quite overwhelming once you get all that footage back. And this film was like six minutes long, so there's a lot of cramped into this edit. I pulled in day one's footage and interviews, and I basically went through the whole interview and built out best of what I could with the sit down interview and the roaming around talking bits and I wanted to give that feel of your kind of listening to Avi almost narrate her story but then you nip away into little sections and pockets of her talking looking through her notebook talking about her granddad talking about how she'd sat down and did these artworks with her mom and her notepad and I really like that it just kind of pulls you away out of that narrative and pulls you in, into the whole situation that Abby is going through so I really like that so I use I basically built the story with that. Once I got the story down, I built the B-roll over the top, just telling the story. There's a lot of times Abby is talking about the community and stuff like that with Digbeth, and I didn't have any Digbeth stuff to go to, so I was like, it's really important that we go back to Digbeth and look at the whole city from that kind of direction. So that's why I really did end up going back for day two. I felt that it was definitely a necessity to get back. So yeah, we went back. So when I'm going through the interview, I use Premiere Pro. It will transcribe the whole interview, which is really useful. So I can kind of follow it through text and chop out the sections I want. And then I'll use markers just to mark sections and write a description on there. So you can easily pull out the bits you want when you're going through it. It's really important to listen through the whole story first. So that's why markers are really important. Instead of just pulling sections out, it can get quite confusing quite quick. So if you use the markers, you can find the bits that you want and then you can start piecing that story together a lot easier. One thing I think is really important is finding that breathing space between sections. When I first did my first edit, it was it was really fast. And although I liked it, there was something wrong with it. And I passed it around a couple of friends who are editors and they were just like, you need a little bit more breathing space. Uh, and I think it's hard when you are editing kind of commercial work where clients want that speed in certain things. So you end up pulling that into projects like this. And when you sit back and you listen to it, you need those breathing space just to let the viewer understand what's happening, what's going on, and just lead and flow into sections. So that's a big tip that I'm gonna give you is really think about the breathing space. For the music on this video, I actually used Artlist.io. I love Artlist and I think it's really a good platform. I'm not sponsored by Artlist, but it's a really great platform. There's a lot of good tunes on there and that's where I found the music for this. I went through, I just listened, I wanted some kind of ambient cinematic-y kind of feel. I didn't want something overbearing on this film. So I went in there, dive through the ambient and cinematic pieces and just listened through for, well, what feels like about four weeks, but it was about a day really. It takes a long time to find the right music and I just would press play and then press play of the audio of Abby talking and I'd just see if that was how it's going to fit for me. And then I ended up finding two nice, really nice tracks that worked with the whole film. Although I did film this off my own back as a little passion project and I was on my own, uh, there's always things to be taken away and things I wish I had done differently. This is why you do these kind of jobs. It's not just for the love of creating, but if you are wanting to be a better filmmaker, then this is essential that you get out there and just create. And being self-critical is definitely part of the improving and growing process. I think I would have liked more time for a start. I should have really done maybe one day interview and then a day in the studio and then a day outdoors. This would have allowed me to think about more time for setups and dialing in sections, especially with that lighting issue. I wish I'd had a kind of pre-production, gone and visit location. It just wasn't possible with this. So it was kind of turn up and work with what you got, which is actually a really good lesson as well. You learn to act quickly to situations because you know you don't have time to mess around. And I was pretty pleased with the results I got. Like I say, if you guys are wanting to get better and 
do films, sometimes you can be held back by the overwhelming feel of actually setting up the process, designing the process. So I would say to you, just get out there, find a friend who's doing something cool. Maybe they're into skateboarding, maybe they're into a sport and you could just go along and document like maybe a day in the life of this person. It's a really good, easy way to get into doing these kind of things and just get out there, just create. You might not create exactly what you want first time off, but you are gonna get better each time. It's just a consistent, constant learning process uh, and it's a really enjoyable one once you get into it i hope this video has helped you guys if you are thinking about doing stuff like this drop some comments in the uh, comment section below if you want to ask any questions i'm always here to try and help you guys i'm also on instagram so head over there check out some of my work and drop me some messages if you're struggling uh, with projects or you want some kind of direction or help with something I'm always there for you guys so I really appreciate you tuning in I hope it's helped and I'll see you on the next one I've been Ian Snape and have a wicked rest of the week see you later